Okay, thank you so much, uh, Yumin, uh, Professor Shung. Yumin, as I've become comfortable calling you, um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak at this colloquium series, um, and it's, it's great to see everyone here. Um, I, uh, I've been, I, you know, I lived in China for a year in 2015 to 2016. I did a research internship on China in DC afterwards, and I've really been focusing a lot of my time and a lot of my research here at Wayne State, um, both on international relations, but specifically um, international relations with a uh, with an eye towards China and, and the rise of China. Um, so I, uh, I'm really excited to share uh, some of the results of that that research over the last year year and a half or so, um, and uh, I look forward to any any questions that you all might have um, afterwards. So again, uh, my talk is uh, on China and Southeast Asia: uh, Why states will bandwagon or balance. Um, so for this presentation, uh, basically four main parts and then a conclusion. I want to give a brief history of uh, Southeast Asia, which I'll, I'll usually refer to by uh, the, the name ASEAN, which is the Organization of Southeast Asian States. Uh, I think that introductory history will kind of help get us all oriented to what's been going on in the region over the last couple of decades. Um, and then following up on that, you know, this sort of big uh, $50,000 question, you know, wh what does China want? What are China's goals in general? What are its goals in the region? Uh, why does China South care about Southeast Asia? Why should we care about why China cares about Southeast Asia? Um, so a little bit of time on that. Um, and then kind of the heart of the presentation will be uh, a, a expansion of bandwagoning or balancing theory. So in the international relations field, this is a sort of a, a key theoretical uh, component of, of international relations, the question of alliances and the question of why and when uh, do states either bandwagon, that is join with really powerful states, or balance against really powerful states. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the key contributions that I sort of hope to make is a expansion of bandwagoning balancing theory, and then testing that theory as it applies uh, to China and its neighbors in Southeast Asia. Uh, and so that'll bring us to the fourth part of the talk, which will be two test cases. Uh, Vietnam and, and the Philippines. As we'll see, uh, Vietnam uh, should be a hard case for my theory and some of my hypotheses. Um, and so we'll get a, get a look at what it actually the theory looks like tested, and then a couple of concluding remarks. Um, okay, so launching right into things. Um, so Southeast Asia today is a very uh, diverse, dynamic region of 11 states, over 600 million people. Um, it's collectively the world's sixth largest economy. So if ASEAN, those 11 states all together, uh, if they were one state, that would be, that state would have the world's sixth largest economy at over $2.6 trillion. And in fact, it's actually the fastest growing, uh, fastest economically growing region over the last uh, decade plus since the financial crisis. Um, it's a region that is rapidly integrating uh, via infrastructure and other institutional and political connections. Um, it's of vital strategic importance. Uh, a lot of people, when they talk about Southeast Asia, you'll hear people talk about the, the Strait of Malacca. Uh, this little, this narrow gap through which a lot of oil and other key commodities and resources pass. So it's often labeled as sort of a, a key strategic, even a key choke point region. Um, and then it's an interesting region because it's, it's not only diverse culturally and ethnographically, but it's politically diverse with, uh, you know, countries uh, that have sort of uh, soft, everywhere from sort of soft democratic, you know, in the Philippines to Myanmar, um, much harder uh, authoritarian. So there's a lot of political diversity in the, in the region as well. And uh, just to give you a sort of a visual orientation to the region, this is what we're talking about. As you can see, uh, you know, it's a, 
it's a maritime region. All the countries, with the exception of of Laos, Laos is landlocked, but every other country is sort of a key uh, maritime country with uh, outlets uh, to to the Pacific Ocean. Um, and and you can see this is the the sort of the uh, strategic choke point I was referring to at the south of uh, Malaysia and Singapore here. This is the, the Strait of Malacca. Um, so a huge amount of commodities are passing through this region, a huge amount of international trade. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this region from China's contested claims in the, in the South China Sea. There are a lot of overlapping claims between China, the Philippines, and Vietnam, uh, and Malaysia. Those countries also have competing claims with each other. Uh, and you know the United States often sails uh, its, its warships through the, this region and near islands claimed by China, freedom of navigation operations. So a lot of times when we hear about China, we were often hearing about the South China Sea and potential tension in, in the area. Um, Okay, so going through an overview of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. ASEAN, and, and a lot of this uh, historical overview, by the way, I'm gonna try to go through it pretty quickly, but it draws from work by John Chirchari, who's a Southeast Asia expert over at the University of Michigan. So I'm gonna draw heavily from, from his work to give an overview of uh, the, the background and history of ASEAN. Um, ASEAN was founded in 1967 uh, by five member states, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. And the idea at that time, it was primarily a, a security organization, uh, or at least the motivations were very much security oriented with the idea being that we five countries have a common interest as small countries in uh, hanging together so that we're, we don't hang separately as we come under potential threat from great powers such as China, such as the Soviet Union, and such as the United States. So this sort of Benjamin Franklin idea of we must all hang together or we will hang separately, that was kind of the unifying idea behind the formation of ASEAN in 1967. Um, to the extent that these countries were looking at, at other big powers, they were largely Western oriented. There was a, a fear of Chinese backed communism. Um, and so banding together allowed these countries to, to focus on internal communist insurgent threats rather than having to focus about uh, on their their state neighbors and you know Indonesia and Malaysia in particular there's uh, this period known as the confrontazi from 63 to 66 um, in which uh, a couple you know a couple of hundred soldiers died on either side uh, ASEAN allowed countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, in Thailand to more or less uh, begin to feel secure with each other and, and focus their energies on, on domestic threats. Um, in the late 60s, you have both the British and the United States with the Nixon doctrine um, announcing that they are gonna take much more of a hands-off approach to the region. So Britain announces they're gonna withdraw from Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, Nixon's doctrine in 69 says uh, regional countries and partners will need to provide manpower for their own defense. At that time, Nixon is, is very much wanting to get out of Vietnam. He's wanting to get U.S. manpower out of the region. And uh, so ASEAN, uh, this is an opportunity, but it's also a, a challenge for them. Um, and, and it leads to their uh, 1971 Zone of Peace, Freedom, and Neutrality Statement, where Southeast Asia uh, aspires to be free from any form or manner of interference by outside powers. Um, so, and, and that's kind of more of an aspiration, but that's a key aspiration when we think about Southeast Asia of this, this sort of ideally to be free, uh, free from uh, outside power, great power competition. Um, okay, so uh, how does ASEAN look towards China at this time? Until the 1970s, um, ASEAN mostly looks westward. None had significant relations with China or the USSR. And remember that Vietnam is not yet part of ASEAN at that time. 
Uh, but Thailand first begins opening to China or uh, in the in the late 70s. Um, and as that happens, ASEAN is also beginning to see the, uh, the Soviet Vietnamese access as its prime threat. And in 1978, Vietnam invades Cambodia and further reinforces that fear. Uh, of course, in 1979, China launches a, a punitive war against Vietnam, um, a short, sharp war, but that's, that's not something that I'm going to go into in any detail here. Um, so in, in the 80s, uh, ASEAN largely begins to accept both U.S. and Chinese engagement uh, as a way to ostracize uh, Vietnam and to deny the new uh, regime in, in Cambodia, the new Vietnam-backed regime in Cambodia. Um, and so ASEAN uh, unites in the 80s against the Soviet Union and, and Vietnam, and that helps uh, enhance the cohesion of ASEAN. Um, and it's and now it's having to rely, though, uh, on China and the U.S. to help balance against uh, Vietnam and, and the Soviet Union, which right away sort of shows the uh, the aspirational, uh, but unfortunately limited uh, aspect of ASEAN to actually implement this neutrality, this uh, Zopfan principle. Um, so. This, I think, can be fairly uh, described now uh, over the decades as the ASEAN way, which is these are small countries who ideally would be free from external great power influence, but that's not the ideal world that they live in. And so they balance for autonomy, given external inevitable external influences they, they sought in the 80s to promote a balance of external influence between China and between the United States uh, aimed at optimizing their autonomy and their security and their leverage. And I think that really very much characterizes the way we should think about Southeast Asia today, at least aspirationally. Um, the question, of course, is whether that aspiration um, to, to rely on multiple external powers uh, will continue to be possible into the future. Um, so ASEAN after the Cold War, the Cold War presents ASEAN with new challenges and opportunities. Uh, the U.S. withdraws from its massive Subic naval base in the Philippines in 1991. Uh, this was, I believe, the second largest U.S. base in the world. So this was a massive military presence that the U.S. had in the Philippines. Um, and, and so that withdrawal creates a, a potential vacuum for China. I mean, it, it's, it's very significant. It can be thought of, you know, if you imagine the significance of the United States announcing that it was going to withdraw troops from, say, South Korea, you know, it's, it probably had a presence on somewhat of a similar scale. So this is a big withdrawal in 1991. Um, but at the same time, uh, in the early 90s, China has positive relations with Thailand, but that's about it. It still has cool relations with the rest uh, of ASEAN. Um, but something happens in the 90s, a couple of things happen, which mark sort of a key turn. Um, and so for those of you who focus on Asia, you'll you probably come across uh, oftentimes uh, the Asian financial crisis of 1997. This seems to crop up over and over again. Um, and the, the, in 1997, there was an Asian financial crisis. Um, this is a, a graph showing the, the massive uh, plunge that the countries in the region, economic plunge that these countries experienced. Uh, Thailand was really a key trigger. Um, and the U.S. responded poorly to this crisis in 97. So the U.S. had been encouraging these countries, Thailand, and others, uh, Malaysia, to liberalize their economies. And these countries had largely been following US and Western advice to liberalize their economies. Then they, I mean, this is an oversimplification, of course, but then they, they, they suffer a crisis partially as a result of that liberalization. And the US is very much sort of just lecturing and hectoring them in response. Uh, meanwhile, China sort of steps into the breach and provides significant financial support. So this is a key turning point in some ways um, 
Uh, and as Chirachari points out, it, he, he calls it a watershed for a ASEAN member approaches to China. Um, it's at that moment that China begins to earn recognition as a crucial economic partner and as a rising great power with regional responsibilities. So that, that's a first sort of key turning point in, uh, to keep in your mind is this 1997 Asian financial crisis. Um, the, at this time, also the ASEAN plus three, that's ASEAN plus uh, China, Japan, and Korea rises while the more Western APEC institution begins to fade in influence. Um, okay, and then also in the 90s, ASEAN expands. So more China-friendly countries like Vietnam, uh, or sorry, uh, Vietnam is, is very much uh, a fence sitter, but more China friendly countries like Laos, Myanmar, and Cambodia, uh, as well as Vietnam, all join ASEAN in the 1990s. And so this begins to further dilute Asian unity, ASEAN unity uh, and perspective. And Myanmar and Cambodia, in particular, they both uh, rely on China to a significant extent for vetoes in the UN and the UN Security Council. So Myanmar and Cambodia are very closely aligned in a lot of ways with China. And, and so their joining of ASEAN begins to further dilute ASEAN unity. And uh, here you can see by time, the sort of, uh, in 67, these are the founding member members and what can be considered the Southern tier of ASEAN. Um, and then it's in the nineties that the rest of the Northern tier, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, et cetera, join. Um, okay, so getting more into the present day in the 2000s, there's increased China economic engagement. There's a free trade agreement between ASEAN and China signed in 2002, uh, building off of the momentum of China stepping into the breach after the 97 financial crisis. And uh, ASEAN, China becomes ASEAN's largest trade power partner since 2008. Meanwhile, as of 2020, ASEAN is also now China's largest trade partner. So the significance really goes both ways, $700 billion in annual trade. This has become a, a very uh, large financial uh, relationship. Um, okay, so to summarize this sort of historical narrative to bring us up to the present and orient us with regard to the region, uh, ASEAN, it's formed in 67 to balance against the great powers, especially the com uh, communist powers. It aspires to be a region of neutrality. In the 80s, it realizes the limits of neutrality. And so it begins to try to play, at least play the great powers off each other to enhance their autonomy that way. Um, and then in the 90s, you have sort of a key turning point with the US withdrawing from the Philippines, its, its military base, the 97 financial crisis and China stepping in to support the countries after that crisis, uh, and then more China-friendly states joining ASEAN. Uh, and then 2002, ASEAN-China Free Trade Agreement is signed. There's a massive expansion of trade ties, uh, which have become larger and larger every year uh, since. Um, so you can sort of see there, there's definitely a, a turning of the tide here that happens slowly in the 90s and then picking up speed in the 2000s. And what we're going to see is into the present day now, with a couple of exceptions, China is overwhelmingly the largest trade partner of all of these of every country in the region massive financial investment, uh, regional institutional uh, connections developing, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's, that's the sort of part one. Um, what, what does China want in Southeast Asia? So this is getting to more of the theoretical aspect uh, of the presentation. Um, and so for this, I draw on John Mearsheimer, who's become even more sort of infamous recently for his position on, on Ukraine and Russia. Um, Mearsheimer's basic uh, thesis is that in an anarchical international system where you cannot call 911 if you're attacked, the, that all states have to rely on a self-help strategy. And the best self-help strategy, Mearsheimer claims, is regional hegemony. You want to be the biggest guy in your region. 
Um, and so Mearsheimer claims this is what the U.S. has done since around 1900, when we began seriously enforcing the Monroe Doctrine, you know, hands off the Western Hemisphere to the European powers. Um, and then Mearsheimer says, well, what do you want to do after that? Well, after you have regional hegemony, your best strategy is to prevent any other state from getting hegemony in its region, right? Because if another state has hegemony in its region, then it's more free to interfere in your region. And so Mearsheimer explains a lot of US foreign policy on this basis, preventing uh, Imperial Germany, Nazi Germany, uh, Imperial Japan, and the Soviet Union preventing all of those states from gaining hegemony over either Europe or Asia was really, really key, he argues. And, uh, and we can think in some ways, this is sort of a good framework, I, thinking, I think, for thinking about US-China tension in Asia today, right? China probably aspires for a hegemonic role in Asia which uh, historically has, has been seen as a key, you know, any other state gaining hegemony in their region, the U.S. has gone to great lengths to try to prevent that. Um, so uh, this is hot, off, fresh off the press from a couple of days ago, uh, just further evidence for this. Uh, Singapore's prime minister, you know, what does China want? I think China treats the Pacific like a near abroad. It's their region. They want friends. They want influence. Um, he says, I cannot read China's president Xi Jinping's mind, um, but he says China explicitly uses this three-part formulation, stand up, get rich, get strong. And Mao has stood up, Dong has gotten rich, and now Xi wants to get strong. Um, so this is why Southeast Asia is so important now, because if you, if you accept this assumption that China desires hegemony in Asia, Northeast Asia is off the table, right? With US military alliances in Japan and South Korea, increasingly even in Taiwan, Northeast Asia is, is unrealistic uh, for China now. Southeast Asia, on the other hand, is more realistic as a potential Chinese, uh, quote unquote, sphere of influence. And so area experts like uh, Shambaugh, Emerson, and the, and the Singapore Prime Minister, Li, they tell us that this is what China desires, and international security experts like Mearsheimer explain why this desire is, is natural, why you should want, for good security reasons, as a great power to try to dominate your region. So, so these are the assumptions that are going into, into uh, this presentation, um, but I think that they are, are, are good, good and valid assumptions. Um, so just in terms of a pat, what a path to regional hegemony might look like in this sort of uh, model, you know, you could think about sort of aspiring to a sphere of influence uh, in Southeast Asia in 2030. And then, you know, that being a logical next step, you know, who knows how the United States is going to be doing politically, who knows what the shape of its alliances are going to be like, you know, will another Donald Trump like figure become president, you know, if, if I'm in China's shoes, and I'm listening to John Mearsheimer, Southeast Asia consolidate strengthen the position and and then tilt back towards South Korea and Japan from a much stronger position in the 2030s and 2040s. Um, so in any case, uh, so the getting to the third part, the sort of heart of the, the talk, um, significance of balancing and bandwagoning behavior, right? So in this, in this uh, presentation, Southeast Asia would be the logical next stop on China's path to regional hegemony. Um, but regional countries obviously have agency. They have a choice whether to bandwagon or, or balance. Um, and so, you know, to paraphrase Thucydides, you know, it's not in China that the contest will be decided between the U.S. and China, but in the countries by which China is supported. Um, and, and that's true for both countries. You know, both countries are very going to be very alliance or sphere of influence dependent. Um, and so China only gains hegemony in Asia if it wins over the support of area countries, i.e. if they jump on the bandwagon, if they bandwagon with China. Um, if that's the case, then it's very important that we accurately assess the factors by which that decision will be made. 
Uh, what, what are the factors, key factors that are going to help determine whether countries bandwagon with or balance against China? Um, and, and so in terms of the state of play, you know, easy countries to sort of look at, there, there are countries like Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, where they more or less seem to be accepting, we will accept diminished sovereignty, diminished autonomy um, in exchange for the political insurance and the economic investments that China provides. So those countries at this point are fairly baked in to a degree to a, the Chinese sphere of influence, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar. In other ASEAN capitals, Chirachari writes, there's a lot of doubt about whether US primacy is A, desirable, but probably even more B, possible as China continues to gather steam. And, um, you know, and, and just a, as a quick heuristic for thinking, you know, what does it mean for China to gather steam? A quick heuristic is just, you know, what is China's economic growth? And so every single year that China grows at 5% or 6%, while the US grows at 2% or 3% is a year that China's relative power gains on the US. Um, and that's been the case for 30, 35 years now. Um, and China's economic growth is slowing, but they're still on pace to continue growing at five, six percent a year, uh, while the U.S. is, is you know, around three percent, um, maybe two percent in a bad year. Uh, so, so there's China is going to continue to increase its power relative to the United States, barring some kind of financial or political uh, unexpected downturn. Um, and so that's why Chiarchari is saying that there's a lot of doubt about, about U.S. primacy in the region. Um, and you can see this in, sometimes in very prominent cases, like the election of the very pro-China, somewhat anti-U.S. Duterte in the Philippines in 2016. Um, but the big takeaway, if you think about going back to that narrative shift of the 90s and the early 2000s and the joining of Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, the key takeaway is that today ASEAN members are much more vulnerable than ever before to being pulled apart. Um, and so the key question is that if there's that vulnerability, what does IR theory, specifically bandwagoning balancing theory, tell us about how Southeast Asian states are likely to behave as China power, China's power advantage continues to grow. Um, so this is sort of the classic IR balancing theory, right? In, in 1979, Kenneth Waltz basically publishes what has since become the Bible in international relations, his theory of international politics. And in, in that text, Waltz says that if states are free to choose they will balance against power, right? And so that's the easy heuristic. If a, if a state is really powerful, you wanna balance against it. Um, in 1985, Stephen Walt twe tweaks that a little bit. He refines that a little bit. He says, well, it's not just power. It doesn't make sense to say states just balance against power, right? Because if states just balance against power, then wouldn't Canada balance against the United States? Wouldn't Europe balance against the United States rather than the Soviet Union? After all, the US was more powerful. And so Walt says, no states, they balance against threat. And power is a component of what makes a state seem threatening. But you also have to take into account things like proximity, capability, and intentions. And so that's a broader understanding um, and that, that maybe means, well, it could be a really powerful state, but if you think they have benign intentions, maybe they're really far away, um, then maybe they're not, states are not likely to balance against them. But the general expectation is that states tend to balance rather than bandwagon. Um, so Walt agrees with Waltz on that, that balancing is more likely. And the reason for that is, is fairly obvious, right? Because um, it's preferable to balance and maintain your autonomy than to bandwagon, in which case, if you're bandwagoning, you're de facto subordinating yourself to a potential hegemon, and you're going to lose some of your autonomy, some of your sovereignty in that decision. So that's why, if you're free to choose, you would choose to balance, ideally. Um, but Walt says there are a couple of factors that increase chances of bandwagoning. 
uh, ideological similarity, very weak states and states with unavailable allies. And so the takeaway is that weak states near great powers are the most likely candidates for bandwagoning. So that sounds like Southeast Asia in a lot of ways, right? Weak states near great power. So Southeast Asia, it sounds like are actually great candidates for cutting against the grain and bandwagoning rather than balancing. Um, are there any other bandwagoning factors? I think Waltz leaves at least five other potential bandwagoning factors out. Right, so he he note, notes these. I think there are at least five additional ones. Um, do states have infrastructure modernization needs? Do states participate in in institutions of a, of a great power? What are the domestic politics of the state like? Some domestic politics are more conducive to bandwagoning, some to balancing. And what about a broader notion of ideological solidarity to include history, culture, possible ethnic commonalities? Um, this would be the Huntington thesis, famous class of, in Clash of Civilizations. Huntington argues that states with cultural similarity will bandwagon with each other. Um, so a broader notion of, of ideological solidarity. Uh, David Kong also makes arguments similar to this. And then finally, uh, intra-regional sort of small, small and small medium state rivalries, right? Is, is, um, is, is uh, Sri Lanka concerned about India? Is uh, Vietnam concerned about Cambodia, right? So if, if states have their own sort of local rivalries, that could be another incentive to turn to a, a near uh, big power patron to help them with local rivalries. Um, so basically what I think that we have to do given the stakes of this question is I think we have to sacrifice more parsimony for greater accuracy, right? So Walt's, Walt already did that. He already sacrificed the parsimony of states balance against power. Um, and when he did that, he pointed us in the direction of, of realizing that Southeast Asia states are actually pretty good candidates for bandwagoning. Um, and so, but we need to further broaden balancing theory, I think, to include at least the five additional factors that I mentioned. Um, so why, why do we need to do that? And I think it's basically because a lot of the theoretical literature still has predicted balancing for Southeast Asia. Um, and then beyond that, US grand strategy is also predicated largely on an expectation of balancing, right? The United States tends to believe if we just show up, if the United States just demonstrates its resolve to the region, then those other states, they'll want to balance and with US support, they will balance. And so this is a key assumption of US strategy is that those states, no, they're not gonna bandwagon with China as long as we are present they will balance against China. And so I think it's really important is to know, is that correct? Accuracy, or, accuracy is, is really essential here. Um, so we need a more accurate assessment um, given the enormous uh, policy implications. So each Southeast Asian state should be assessed in Walt's three plus the additional five factors I mentioned. And these additional factors will give us a more accurate sense of whether states are likely to balance or bandwagon. Um, okay, so in, in short, you know, Waltz uh, is power, you know, states balance against power. Uh, Walt adds proximity, capability, and intentions. And then I would argue we need to add, add at least these five additional factors and, and then try to find a way of weighing all of these factors and, and putting them all together uh, and then testing that to, to see whether states are, are likely to bandwagon or balance. And so this is a little bit more of an easier presentation, um, factors influencing balancing versus bandwagoning. Um, and as you can see, most of the factors that I'm adding, infrastructure needs, institutional participation, historical cultural affinity, non-China local rivalries, these are all factors uh, that if present are likely to um, increase uh, the incentive for countries to, to bandwagon rather than balance. Um, so factors one and three, there's not gonna be any variation in the region, right? One and three, all states are gonna view China as very powerful with a lot of capability. So everyone is gonna be inclined to balance based on those factors. Um, and similarly, 
uh, all states have high infrastructure needs, number five. So there's a, a sort of a, a non-variable uh, bandwagoning tendency as well with infrastructure. There should be significant variation on in Southeast Asia on factors two, four, and six through nine. So there's very, you know, there are different distances from China. Uh, different states are going to view China's intentions differently. And then different states are going to have varying domestic politics, various historical cultural affinity, various local rivalries. So there's going to be some variation on a lot of these, on a lot of these factors. Um, my hypothesis is that the more countries have high infrastructure needs, concentrated and performance legitimation, domestic politics, high levels of participation in Chinese-led institutions, broad cultural historical affinities, and non-China local rivalries, the more likely they will be to bandwagon with China. Um, and so to summarize, again, what is the state of play in the region? Uh, there, you know, RAND experts have grouped them into three categories, countries that are in China's camp, like Cambodia, Laos, countries that will never join, like Jap Japan and India, and then hedging countries like in Indonesia, Malaysia, and, and Thailand. Um, I chose Vietnam because Vietnam should be considered a hard case, right? Experts tend to think that Vietnam is a country that will never join the Chinese camp. And so if you could find tendencies in Vietnam towards bandwagoning, that would go a long way, I think, as a bellwether towards understanding bandwagoning tendencies in the region in general. Um, so how to test. Uh, use bargaining theory, which suggests that countries that are resolved will send costly signals, costly signals about their intent to balance, and that would include increased military spending and reduced economic relationships. So that's how I'm going to try to test this hypothesis. Um, so just to sort of give a theoretical summary before going into the final test, uh, how do we know China wants a sphere of influence in Southeast Asia? Mearsheimer's theory of offensive realism and China experts also tend to agree based on empirical observations. Uh, so in order to see whether this is possible, we need to expand balance of power theory beyond balance against threat to balance against a spectrum, those nine characteristics to more accurately predict balancing and future behavior. And then we need to find a way of testing whether these factors are accurately predicting things. And that's a very difficult thing to do, but one way we can begin to at least do it is look at our state sending really costly military and economic signals indicative of balancing, if not some more suggestive of bandwagoning behavior. Um, so uh, test cases, Vietnam and the Philippines identify where they stand on, on these factors, give a face validity assessment of how these factors translate to bandwagoning or balancing behavior, and then test. So Vietnam, um, quickly going through these factors, uh, China's intentions, they view China's intentions as aggressive, but not existential. That leads towards balancing. Uh, high infrastructure needs, estimated 25 billion a year, high institutional participation with BRI, AIIB, many others. China and Vietnam also, surprising to many, have a comprehensive strategic cooperative partnership. It's Vietnam's highest classification level. Um, and, and so I think these all point towards bandwagoning. It's domestic politics, concentrated power, and identity-based legitimation. Uh, I probably won't have time to go into that, but there is a, uh, a, uh, a square that I've used to, to make that determination. I'll come back to it in questions if people want to go into it in more detail. Um, in, in short, uh, Vietnam has both balancing and bandwagoning domestic characteristics. Uh, historical cultural affinity huge, you know, a thousand years of a shared border, mostly peaceful, uh, extreme Vietnamese emulation of, of Chinese uh, culture and governmental practices. Um, Vietnam is so interesting to me because a lot of IR experts, if you just ask them about Vietnam, there tends to be this sort of knee-jerk expectation that Vietnam and China are sort of mortal enemies and they've always been that way. David Kong argues this is mostly a, ninth, or a 20th century uh, national myth 
uh, that this is mostly an invention of the 20th century and that, you know, there have been 20th century tensions. But if you look over the, you know, years 1300 to 1800, by and large, the relationship has been quite stable, quite peaceful, quite accommodating. Um, and Vietnam has, has adopted a lot of Chinese cultural and governmental practices over the centuries. So I would say very high cultural historical affinity, which leads towards bandwagoning. Uh, Non-China local rivalries, uh, yes, uh, Vietnam is very concerned about Cambodia as well. Um, so overall assessment, we have a couple of factors uh, leading to balancing, a couple of factors leading to bandwagoning. Um, again, a key question is how to more precisely weigh these different factors. I recognize that's an issue, but just on a sort of a face validity initial assessment of it, it's, it's fairly split with a slight edge towards balancing, a slight bias towards balancing. Um, but I would say Vietnam could likely be nudged in either direction over time based on these factors. Okay, so, and I recognize I need to wrap up in the next uh, three or four minutes here, um, but uh, Vietnam test. Oh, so, okay, so testing to see whether Vietnam is sending costly signals indicative of quote unquote slight balancing. And so let's look at military spending and economic exposure to test this. So if we look at Vietnam's absolute military spending um, from the early at the late 80s into the 2000s, it looks like it's it's rising quite a bit. Um, but you have to keep in mind, Vietnam is starting from a very low base of around a billion or a less than a billion dollars of military spending on a year and rising to about 5 billion as of uh, 2018. Um, so on the one hand, that seems like a lot, right? Wow, 500% increase from 1 billion to 5 billion. Um, but keep in mind, Vietnam is an economy of almost $300 billion. So $5 billion a year out of an economy of $300 billion, this actually only translates to a percent GDP spending of a little over 2%. And uh, in reality, China's been, or Vietnam has been growing a lot over the last couple of decades, but the percent of its GDP that it's been allocating to its military has remained relatively flat at around 2.2%. The global average is about 2%, to put that in global perspective. Uh, so slightly higher than global average percent GDP military spending. In terms of Vietnamese trade, these are percent trade shares. China is Vietnam's largest trading partner, uh, almost $100 billion of, of trade a year. So very significant. Um, so it, you would think if, if Vietnam was balancing against China, like many of these countries, it would limit its economic exposure, limit its economic vulnerability to China. It doesn't seem to be doing that considering uh, how, how significant its, its trade relationship is. Um, so is Vietnam sending costly signals? It's spending slightly more than the global average, so a slight costly signal, and it's, it's not sending any costly economic signals. So Vietnam is, is hedging, and the, the, these empirical tests seem to support um, the, the, the expectations based on those nine factors of slight balancing behavior. Um, I'm not going to go through the Philippines in detail because uh, I'm running out of time and I want to uh, get to the conclusions. Um, other than I could quickly sort of show uh, Philippines uh, military spending is so what is a country like the Philippines that's much more likely to accommodate it's only spending 1% of its military uh, of its GDP on military spending and it's also China's overwhelmingly largest uh, trade partner. Um, okay, so getting to the conclusion. Uh, there's no evidence of significant balancing behavior across ASEAN states. Vietnam, in many ways, is the most difficult case, and there's only slight evidence of balancing behavior. Uh, Vietnam included all ASEAN countries are allocating less, not more, of their revenue to military spending. Uh, China has become the largest trading partner of just about every ASEAN country. The only exceptions are countries like small countries like Brunei that trades more um, with uh, um, Singapore. Um, but uh, over just about every country has China as its largest uh, trading trading partner. 
Um, and, and countries are not sending costly signals. Mo uh, most countries spend less than 2% of GDP on their military. And so bargaining theory, seen as Kong is arguing, is pretty clear in this regard. Resolved or balanced countries send costly signals, and Southeast Asian countries are not sending costly signals. Um, so obstacles to China's future ambitions. Uh, Southeast Asia is likely to continue to try to maintain uh, relationships with other great powers to maximize its autonomy. Uh, the question is whether this is going to eventually tip overwhelmingly into China's favor. Uh, all other obstacles, China has to contend with existing US-led institutions and the military presence, and then consolidating a sphere of influence is not ultimately going to achieve China's goal of Asian hegemony, right? They still have to go back up to Northeast Asia. So these are some obstacles. Um, Opportunities for Chinese success in the region, these infrastructure and institutional investments are just going to get stronger and more interconnected and more path dependent over time. Um, and I think my hypothesis is that the incentives to bandwagon are only going to go up over time with these economic and institutional relationships. Uh, and then greater bandwagoning is going to facilitate China's goal of creating a sphere of influence, which would then allow it to tip back up to Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, and the regional embrace of countries of, of institutions like BRI, AIIB, et cetera, suggest that China is moving expeditiously down this path. The final question that I just want to leave people with um, based on uh, the, the overview presented so far, is a foreign policy question. This is really outside the scope in a lot of ways, but uh, it gets back to what, what are the real stakes of this? And the stakes of this is that American foreign policy is going back to Mearsheimer, is trying to prevent the rise of a, another regional hegemon by maintaining the status quo it's established since World War II. The problem with that as Allison points out, is that the underlying economic balance of power has tilted and continues to tilt and will likely continue to tilt ever more dramatically in China's favor. And so the question is that if these trends continue, if the incentives for bandwagoning continue to grow over the incentives to balance, should the US continue to rely on its foreign party uh, policy strategy of resolve? Right. In other words, the U.S. thinks that these countries will and want to balance against China if only they can be sure of U.S. commitment to the region. But what if that entire premise, what if that entire assumption is incorrect? What if no amount of U.S. resolve is ultimately going to compensate for the strong financial and institutional incentives these countries have to bandwagon? then what would it mean for the U.S. to continue to be so, so resolved? Um, the alternative is that the U.S. should possibly begin to consider or reconsider what a realistic defensive perimeter in Asia might, might actually look like. And with that, I will conclude the talk, and I would love to hear any, any questions. Thank you.